Last week we introduced this um, letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Uh, remember he was in prison when he wrote it. And this was a church that at one time was doing really, really well. And when Paul wrote the letter to the church in Colossae, it was a church that was in decline. They were going the wrong direction. It kind of mirrored what was going on in the city of Colossae. At one time, Colossae was on the main road that went from east to west all the way into Iraq and Iran where the, those cities or countries are now. There was a main road that went from that part of the Middle East all the way through and found its way to Ephesus that was on the shore of the, sea, the Aegean Sea. And so it went right through Colossae, which was about 100 miles to the east. But over time, they moved the road and Colossae got bypassed. And as they bypassed the town, it kind of went in decline, like so many cities around uh, the United States when they put the interstates in. They just went into decline. They, they were off the beaten path. And so that was what was going on in the city of Colossae. It was also what was going on in the church in Colossae. It started out really, really well. Epaphroditus went to Ephesus. He became a Christian. Learned about Jesus, went back to his hometown, own town, and started a church. And um, as you remember last week, we talked about how this church was known all over the world for its faith. So it tells you a little bit about it. But now they were going backwards, and Paul was writing this letter as a course correction, if you will. And I encourage you to get last week's, um, you can watch it online, our YouTube channel. If you didn't get to listen to that, even listen to it again, because it's a, just a great uh, word of encouragement for us in the terms of our obedience. So that was last week. Today, we're going to be reading from Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 18, all the way through to chapter 4, verse 1. Um, most of your Bibles, if they're recent translations, will have a, a break between chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 2, instead of at the chapter break. So these really, chapter 4, verse 1, goes with uh, the rest of chapter 3. So what I like about the passage that we're going to read today is it's a perfect fit for Father's Day. There's just a great message in here for dads, for fathers. Um, we didn't plan it that way. It just was a coincidence, right? It was a God coincidence. And uh, so it, see if you can see, as I read these verses, see if you can see um, this perfect message for Father's Day. Colossians 3, verse 18. Here it is. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. You get it? This perfect message for Father's Day. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Don't say anything, guys. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Come on, ladies. Let me hear it. That's the perfect message for Father's Day, isn't it? Or children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Come on, all the parents. That's the... Perfect message for Father's Day. Sorry, youth. We're going to camp on that for a while. Or, verse 21, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Which one do you want me to teach on today? We can just put numbers on the screen and you can all vote. Before I get into it, let me finish um, the rest of this section that Paul's talking about. Um, bond servants... It, we're not bond servants today, but if you are an employee of somebody, you're a bond servant in, in one aspect or another, okay? So how many are employees in the house? Women, men or women, okay? So employees, um, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. You don't have to go to work tomorrow and call your boss your, boss, your earthly master, but obey everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, so when they're looking at you, don't, don't try to look good. Or as eye pleasers or brown nosers, that's a different translation, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Okay, verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. 
for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality. Now, in between services, one of our young guys was telling me he just got a new job a couple of months ago and um, another person that got a job in the same company had gotten a raise and he learned about this person getting a raise and he was ticked, he was irritated. He said, I almost quit my job on Friday because I learned so-and-so got a quarter an hour raise and I didn't get one. And so, or I was either gonna quit my job or I was gonna say, well, if you're not gonna pay me anymore, I'll just work for what you're paying me. I'm just gonna be that guy. And I said, now listen, that's not the Lord. <laughs> you know, you, and he understood. He's just a person in my life that I get to mentor and disciple. But he was ready to just, you know, if they're gonna treat me that way, then I'm just gonna work half-heartedly. And I said, go back and read these verses we just read. Who are you working unto? The Lord, right? That's what Paul is saying here. Um, we'll get to the message at hand. But I just want to encourage you, if you're working for somebody, don't work as, uh, as if you're trying to please them or, or win favor with them. Because really, you're trying to win favor with the Lord. Amen. You receive that? And if you do, I'm pretty sure you're going to get rewarded. That's the way it works. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 1, masters, employers, treat your bondservants or your employees justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, Paul addresses three different relationships in those verses. There's husbands and wives. There's parents and children, employers and employees. And incidentally, those verses almost mirror what he wrote uh, to the church in Ephesus um, he addressed all three of those in chapter 5 and part of chapter 6. But obviously, the relationship I want to focus on this morning is the one between children and parents, and more specifically, the relationship that we fathers have for our children. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about fathers this morning because it's Father's Day. However, this is a message to every mom and every dad that's here, okay? All of this applies to every parent. And we'll make some, kind of wind it up at the end of my message, but I am going to refer a lot to fathers. Paul said, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Some definitions just so we understand what Paul is saying here. The Greek word for provoke is only used two times in the entire New Testament. Kind of odd. So when you see a word is only used once or twice in the New Testament, you know that Paul chose that word specifically. It's not a random word. It's something that he, he picked out uh, in particular. And the word in this case is used in the negative. Fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, it's used in the positive where Paul tells the church in Corinth that their enthusiasm for giving provoked all the other churches to give. So it can be either good or bad. Really, what the word means is, is by your actions or something that you do as a person, it causes a reaction in somebody else. Okay? That's all it means. It can be good. It can be bad. The word provoke. And then he uses the word discourage. Discourage, obviously most of you know, means to lose heart or to break one's spirit. James Dobson wrote a great book on parenting that refers to that a number of years ago. It means to diminish one's value or smother them or take the life out of them. And Paul is writing to fathers. He's saying, I, I don't want you to do anything that would in any way smother the life or break the spirit or cause your children to lose heart. And in antiquity, kids were treated much differently than they're treated today. Uh, many, many years ago, people had lots and lots of kids. And if you know your history, you know that children, even your own children, were treated like slaves until they became a certain age. Paul even refers to that in Galatians. They just, they're just slaves. I kind of like that idea. Um, I need some more slaves around our property. It's a little too late to have kids, but I mean, they, they were treated as property. They, they were chattel. Um, they, parents would smother the life. They would diminish the value. They would break the spirit. They would strip them of their worth. That was just common. And here's Paul writing to these new Christians in Colossae. 
understand, guys, this isn't new fathers. They could have been fathers of 40-year-olds or 60-year-olds or, in your case, well, 70-year-olds almost. They, they could have been fathers of old people or young kids. And he, he, so he wasn't, this wasn't a, you know, a parenting class for new parents. He was talking to people that were new Christians who had done it wrong for a lot of years. And he was encouraging them with this message. You can change the way that you do it. Aren't you glad for that, guys? No matter how many years have passed, no matter how many times you've got it right, wrong, I mean, God can change your legacy. He can change the way that you parent. And that's really what Paul was addressing here. I am so glad for that because we miss it all the time as dads, don't we? So he's saying, don't provoke your children by the things that you do, by your actions. Don't cause a reaction that's negative. I want to add this. There's two translations at least. The King James Version, which is written in the 1500s. And then there's another translation. Uh, I forget which one it was. But the, at least two translations add two words to what Paul is saying here that causes misunderstanding or brings the wrong interpretation. They add the words, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. It's not a bad thing to add there, but sometimes people misunderstand that to, to think that anytime we discipline our children and it, it elicits anger in them, that that's wrong. That's not what Paul is saying here. I don't know if it's possible to discipline your children and not have them angry at you, right? Even the most compliant, you know, well-behaved child, you take away a privilege and they're going to be mad for a while. Is that not true? Does anyone in the room have a, a child that I want to meet them? If you've had a child that you could discipline and they would not get mad. I mean, that's just how we are. It's, it's our sin nature, isn't it? So this isn't an injunction against some kind of parenting that brings anger. I don't know how many conversations I've had. Now I don't have to have them very often, thankfully. But when my kids were in high school, especially conversations you had at 10 and 11 and 12 on a Saturday night and they were mad at you and you had to get up and preach on Sunday morning. You try that out as a parent. That is not fun or easy. They just get mad at you. Sometimes I thought, okay, well, get mad. I, I think I must be doing something right if you're getting mad. So it's not an injunction against that. What it is, is it's an injunction or it's an instruction for us not to parent in ways that move our kids from wholeness to brokenness in their spirit. And God hates that. Because who gave us our children? He did. Our quiver is blessed when he gives us arrows in our, our, our quiver, our children. He, he gave us our children. And so it's incumbent upon us as fathers to raise them in ways that don't provoke a negative reaction, but raise them in ways that provoke a positive reaction. And so really that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, the title of my message is Super Dad. How many super dads do we have here? None, right? <laughs> You're trying, right? Um, there are days you feel like a super dad. Uh, Father's Day, you kind of feel like a super dad because you get those Father's Day cards that tell you how great you are. You're the smartest, the strongest, the nicest, the kindest, the most loving dad that's ever existed. How many have gotten cards like that? I've, I've saved every Father's Day card that my children have given me and they're in a box in our bathroom in a drawer and Friday I got them out and I started reading through those just to build yourself up you know because you're feeling down now uh, you know you read those it's like man I am super dad some days you just feel like it you feel like a super dad when your kid gets up and they play their piano recital piece perfectly in front of a bunch of people you just think wow I did something right then even though I had nothing to do with that. Usually it was their mom telling them to practice. And, but, but you feel like a super dad, don't you? Or you feel like a super dad when they befriend somebody? Or when they go out for something you would have never went out for? Like, oh man, I, that's just so cool. Or, or when they follow your passions in a certain way, you feel like super dad? But 
Men of the house, is it not true that you feel like super dead more than anything when they follow you in your passion for Jesus? Of all the things I want my children to become, the number one thing is that they would have a love for God. They would love Jesus. They would commit their life to Him. Anything else they do is just a bonus. And so this morning, I want to just talk about how we do that. Our failures don't define us. Parenting is about doing more right things than wrong things. Every day times 365 days times all the years that you've been a parent. I've been a parent over 11,000 days now. And I'm going to be one another few thousand years, hopefully. Days, hopefully. But I want to do more right than wrong. And more than anything, I want to provoke my kids. By the things that I do, I want to cause a reaction in them towards the positive. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. Three things. Number one, the first thing that we must get right as dads is we must love God and we must love His house. We must love God and we must love His house. Did you know that Father's Day is the least attended day in church of all the holidays that we celebrate? Fewer men come to church on Father's Day than any other day. Can we thank the dads that are here this morning? And the opposite, Mother's Day, the most well-attended day in church outside of Christmas and Easter. Isn't that something? I don't know what that means. Maybe Dad's Day, you go golfing or you go fishing or it's your day like you need a break compared to your wife's, which is kind of funny, isn't it? But, but uh, we have to show a love for God and His house. Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than repair broken men. So true, isn't it? 90% of the parenting choices that we made when our kids were little were in regards to building strong adults. You know, it, if I live with that now, what's it going to look, look like in 30 years? That's just how you, I analyze things. It's not, is this going to hurt them now? Is, is this going to hurt them in 30 years? I'd rather build strong children than try to fix a broken adult. We have to get this right. We have to love God and we have to love His house. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You've all heard that verse. <coughs> I heard an explanation of that verse this past week by Skip Heitzig. He's the pa pastor of Calvary Chapel in Albuquerque. And he said that kind of the, the story behind Proverbs 22, 6 was this. When in antiqu antiquity or the olden days, um, they would have nurses or other women that would nurse your children, babies. It just seems odd to me. Um, they were called wet nurses. And the way that they would stimulate um, a baby to nurse is they would take some, something that was kind of sweet and they would rub it on their gums and it would, the sucking instinct would begin to come and it would, it, it would birth this desire in them to nurse. You are giving the, the baby, the child, an appetite to nurse. And he said that that's kind of the background for this proverb. Train up a, a child in the way he should go. And when he's old or she is old, she will not depart. You're giving them an appetite for the things of the Lord. I love that illustration. And we give them an appetite for the things of the Lord when we love God. There's so many intangibles that we pass on. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we love God and we love His house. How do we love the house of God? Well, we love it by being there. Hebrews says, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another until all... the all the more as you see the day drawing near. Like we, when we attend church on a regular basis, we are showing our love for God and our love for His house. Another way that we show our love for His house is by serving His house, right? And there's lots of ways to serve. 
You can serve in ways where, you know, you have a title. You can serve in ways that you're just doing what you like to do. You like to repair things. You like to clean things. You like to weed things. You like to serve people. You like to cook things. There's so many ways to serve the Lord's house. And would we want, if we want to provoke a godly reaction in our children, one of the greatest things we can do is serve his house. And so I encourage you, just find a way to serve his house. It doesn't have to be a quote-unquote official ministry of the church. There's so many ways to do that. My dad was extremely quiet. I mean, he said nothing. He didn't give me any advice ever. Not, I mean, just, it just wasn't in him. It was part of the way that he was raised. But one thing he did so well is he just served the house of God. He didn't tell me why he did it. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. He, he just did it. And because he did it, I got it. I caught it. Men and women serve the house of the Lord. The last way we show our love for the house of God is by honoring it. We honor it with our words. If you've ever had someone in your home that hated their job and they come home at the end of the day and they tell you how awful it is, how awful the, their supervisor is, you know, how terrible the conditions are. When you're hearing those things, you just think, I don't want to ever work there. I don't want anything to do with that company. I don't want anything to do with working where they work. And if your parent or somebody in your home loves their job and they build it up, there's something in you that's just drawn to that. I'd like to try that sometime. The same is true about the church. We honor the church by the way we talk about it. We have to get that right. As fathers, we have to show that we love God and we love His house. The next thing that we have to get right as dads is we have to talk with our children about our why. Right? We have to tell them why we do what we do. Why we believe what we do. Why we turn to the Lord in times of difficulty. Why we turn to the Lord in times of grief. We have to talk about our why. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7, this is God speaking to the Israelites. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, if you read that verse literally, it seems like all you would be doing is talking about the commands of the Lord, right? When you rise, when you lie down, when you sit down, when you're in your living room, when you're going out, it's all you do is talk about the commands of the Lord. I don't think that's what God meant here. Really what I think God meant here is you talk about the commands of the Lord in each of those circumstances. When, when the circumstances arise and there's grief and there's disappointment or you're just sitting around or you can't sleep or you're up, you know, that's when you as moms and dads talk to your kids about the commands of the Lord. And when you do that, something powerful happens in them. But that is not easy. How many moms or dads would say, that's so hard for me to do. It's awkward. I can relate. Like I said, my dad said nothing, anything. We would go to breakfast with me and some guys from our church later on in life. I just was trying to build a relationship with them. And so I would go to breakfast with him. He would sit there and not say anything the whole morning. He would just listen. He was so quiet. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just who he was. And so for me to learn to talk to my children about God was not easy. Just because I do this for a living now, you may think it just flows out of me. It didn't flow out of me. I had to make myself do what I had never seen modeled before me. But you can learn it. And when you learn it, you provoke something powerful in your kids. It's such a great truth that we can all grasp. We tell our kids about our why. And it's, it's kind of hard to get started. It might even seem awkward. But I just want to encourage you guys, no matter how old you are, look for those opportunities when you're in the living room, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when, you're, when you get up to, when you rise in the morning, look for those opportunities. God was clear that we need to be clear with our children about why we do the things we do. I think David was a great example of that. We have all of the Psalms and the things, ways that he encouraged his sons, most specifically Solomon. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, this is Solomon talking about his dad. He said, 
Now he's addressing his sons. He says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight, for I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Verse 3, When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and he said to me, Let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. Solomon is now passing it on to the next generation. I don't know what David's dad taught him. If we think about David's background, he was the shepherd out in the field. He was the one who his dad didn't even bother to call when Samuel came to anoint the next king. It was almost like he didn't matter. Maybe his dad had provoked him to some kind of negative reaction. But David started something with his sons. And now here is, is his son telling his sons, I want you to do what I did. I want, I'm going to do what my dad taught me. Listen to my commandments and it'll go well with you. And David did that in all kinds of circumstances, as we know. He did it when he was in grief. He did it when he was in disappointment. He did it when he sinned. The, the, the sin with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, is all about him telling his sons and sharing the story with his kids. Guys, we have to get this right. We have to tell our kids about our why. Why we do what we do. And even now, I want to just encourage you, no matter how hard it is, God will give you the strength to do it. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to read like a psalm, you know. It doesn't have to be poetic. You just share your heart and your kids will get it. It will provoke them to something good. And lastly, the last thing we must get right as dads is we must model what we profess, right? Ecclesiastes 5 says, if we make a vow and we break it, it's better that we didn't make it at all. We have to model what we profess, one way we do that is by allowing our children to see us love other people. It maybe it's one of the greatest things that we do, especially the ones that matter to our children. You know, that they see us as husbands love their mom. They see us as a married couple love their grandparents, in-laws, aunts and uncles. When th those, are the, those are the people that our children are the closest to they're also the people that annoy us the most, right? I mean, I, I cringe when I hear an adult running an in-law into the ground. It's like, oh man, don't do that. Because it's just going to be multiplied. You, it, when, if we are going to model what we profess, the greatest way we can do that is by modeling it, by loving those that our kids know the best. Yes, we're supposed to love everyone, but those that our kids are closest to. We do more damage by running those in the ground than anyone else. Let's model what we profess. Another way we model what we profess is by guarding what we say. How many times have you heard your kids mimic the way that you talk? I don't mean four-letter words, because they do mimic that occasionally, but it's more the attitude. And they mimic critical attitudes, or they mimic ways that you shame other people, negative attitudes, where you expose things. Man, when your kids do that, it's just painful. And I'm sure that most everyone in this room has seen that happen in your children. It's like, oh man, that's me. We have to put a guard over our mouth. When Ryan was talking about this on Wednesday night at Man Church, he just did a great job talking about what we say. Proverbs 11.9 says, With our mouths, or their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbors. We want to provoke our kids to destruction, then we speak those things. Proverbs 4.24, Keep your mouth Dads, free of perversity. What you excuse in moderation, your kids will excuse in excess. The old proverb is so true. Keep your mouths from perversity. Speak what is wholesome, what is good. Proverbs 14.3 A fool's mouth lashes out with pride, but the lips of the wise protect them. What a great picture. My lips can protect me or it can just gush with pride. Proverbs 15, 4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, 
but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 15, 28 says, a perverse tongue gushes evil. Proverbs 18, 7 says, a perverse tongue is their undoing. Like those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity is what Proverbs says. Husbands, fathers, men of the house, moms, if we want to provoke a good reaction in our kids, we have to put a guard over our mouth. It's like a muzzle. We were uh, riding our bikes the other day on the bike path and there's this, this pit bull with a muzzle over its mouth and that told, told me something, right? Like that's not a good dog to mess with. And I wanted to thank the owner for putting that muzzle on their dog's mouth. How many would like to put a muzzle on somebody else's mouth from time to time? Like, or how many would like to thank the owner for putting a muzzle on our mouth? Like, Lord, would you put a guard over my mouth? Because I want to provoke my kids to good and not bad, to positive and not negative. Lord Jesus, not critical things, but constructive things. I want to provoke, provoke that in my kids. Lord, we're building a legacy. Just as David started something with his sons, we're building a legacy. So God, may we love you and may we love your house. Oh God, may we model what we profess and help us in the way that we talk. In Jesus' name, amen. Just one final thing. Um, I want to encourage you that it's never too late to act. Today can be a day that you build an altar to change the way that you parent. Brother Brian was telling me a story before church. It's never too late for a miracle. It's never too late to build an altar to change. Isn't that right? No matter how old you are, no matter what you've been through, today can be the best Father's Day because you're going to make a choice to change the way that you parent. Amen? The other thing I want to say is to those of you that are single parents, whether you're a, a, a wife or a mom, I mean, or a, 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 a female or a male, whether you're a mom or a dad, um, you know, we, we have a, you have a heavier load. It's harder for you. Some are single parents in the faith. You're married, but you don't share that same conviction with your spouse. So whether you're a single parent or in the faith or whether you're just a single parent, I want to encourage you in this. You do your part and God always does his part. Amen. There are so many stories in the Bible of, of children who didn't have anyone speaking into their life and God just showed up and he changed their trajectory. So you do your part and God will do his part. You don't need anyone else. The Holy Spirit is in you and God is with you. Uh, the other thing I want to encourage you is God loves your kids more than you do. So he will do his part. You just do your part. And then the last thing I want to encourage you and it's a bit of a contradiction and that's this. Even if you don't do your part, God's going to do his part. Isn't that true? How many stories in the Old Testament are there of these kids whose fathers were just pagans? They were horrible. And God spoke something into those young lads and they changed their lives. And in many cases, they changed their world. God loves your kids more than you do. So even if you don't do your part, he's going to do his part. That's who he is. He's the God who redeems. He loves your kids more than you do. But here's our chance as parents, moms and dads, to provoke a positive reaction to our kids. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to just ask you a quick question, give you a chance to respond. If you're here and today day that you'd like to just make a commitment to parenting different, maybe one of these things spoke to you or just as we talked about parenting, something else came to your mind. I want you to know it's not the Holy, it is the Holy Spirit that's talking to you, it's not me. The Holy Spirit is in this room right now. He has a way of speaking every person's language. He knows where you're at. He knows what's going on in your home. He knows where your kids are. He knows how you failed. He knows the future and you don't know it. He is here and he's ministering to you. And as we have spoken of these things, if you're here and you'd say, I just want to make a commitment to change something about the way I parent. It might be how I model things. It might be how I speak. It might be how I love the church. It might be whatever it is. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand where you're seated, okay? all over this room. Say, so I'm going to change something. 
I'm just going to wait a little while longer. Just raise them up high. The Lord is speaking to you. All right. Now, you can put your hands down. That's the Lord speaking to you. You have to do something about it. And as we leave here in just a matter of a few minutes, I want to encourage you to build an altar around that commitment. Whatever that means for you. You might go home and write a letter. You might... Uh, Go home and take some time and pray. You might make a new commitment uh, to a new discipline, whatever it is. But I want you to respond to that. Don't let this moment pass without you responding to it. Say, Lord, I, I know you've spoken and now I'm going to respond to you. I'm going to change. Now, some of you, you you're going to find it very difficult to do those things in the natural. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit dwells in you so richly and God will give you strength in your weakness. Now I want to pray for you. Father, it would, it would be impossible for me to do what I do without your grace and your mercy. Lord, you, you have walked with me so many times. So every step along the way, you have walked with me. You've walked with every dad in this room and every mom in this room. We could not do it without your grace. That's the first thing we acknowledge. Lord, anything good in our kids is from you. It, it's all to your credit. It's you, oh God. But we are also asking, Lord, that we can change the way that we parent so that we provoke more right responses than wrong ones, whatever that means for each of us. Lord, thank you that Paul saw fit to write about this while he's sitting in a prison. Lord, that just blows my mind, actually. But Lord, it was so important he had to address that. And Lord, it does need to be addressed. Lord, may the children of the church be strong. Lord, may they be bold. May they have courage. God, may you just knit in them strength, Lord. They need it more now than ever. And God, you use us as parents. So we're asking for your favor and your blessing and your knowledge and your wisdom. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Happy, happy Father's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. We're doing it together. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We will see you next Tuesday on the bike ride or next Saturday on the hike. All right. Or next Sunday.